So to proceed with uh, the presentations and our speakers, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Julia Athena Spitarakis. She's a dual national born in New York City. She's a fortune in America on the base of her heritage, which is Czech, Slovak, Romanian, and Greek. Her main educational background is on primary education, while she holds a Master in Education Counseling and Guidance, and a PhD in Multilingual Multicultural Education. She is an active member of the Children's Identity and Citizenship European Association, to which she has also served as an elected president. She is a member of the editorial and advisory boards for various periodicals and scientific journals, such as the Journal of Elementary Education of the University of Maryland, Slovenia, and the directions in English language teaching and testing of the National and Cambodian University of Athens. She is currently an associate professor for the Department of Primary Education in the University of Padras on the field of multilingual and multicultural education, curriculum and teaching approaches. Today she is here with us to present us her thoughts and experiences on diversity and communication. today to talk with you about diversity and communication. Uh, as a long-time educator, I've been in education since a little bit formal millennia. Uh, I've been teaching for over 40 years. I've taught elementary school, junior high school, high school, university. My youngest student was five and my oldest 83. So I've, I've been there for a while. Um, diversity and communication. Okay, let's see if it's going to work today. It doesn't want to. <laughs> Technology is a wonderful thing when it wants to work. <laughs> um, as you're told, I'm um, in the uh, division of pedagogy in the Department of Elementary Education at the University of Padras. Okay, the social, the reality of social change. Because if we're going to be talking about diversity and communication, we have to know why. Why is it necessary? Okay, this is a nice little graph that talks about population growth in Europe from 1950 and estimation through 2050. The countries noted are Germany, United Kingdom, Italy, France, Spain, Poland, Turkey, and the Netherlands. The only one that shows growth past 2000, upwards growth, positive growth, is tricky. All the rest are going down. Now you would say, oh, well, Europe is getting smaller. Um, actually, Europe is changing. Europe isn't getting smaller. Its character, its culture, its identities are changing because of the movement of populations into the countries, both on a migratory premise as well as a more permanent one. Now, my, da my data, my stats differ slightly from your own here. Um, population in 2013 of Europe, 733 million, of which the non-European citizens, <coughs> um, non-European population numbers are estimated between 35 and 40 million. Um, Two-thirds of that population is in the European Union, in the 27, 28 countries, of which, in January 2014, the number was 507.4 million. <coughs> I, I tend to update this chart fairly regularly. Um, and in a five-year period, that number increased by over 50 million. In the EU, if we count the uh, population relative to the numbers that have non-European origin, um, and I'm talking about people coming into Europe, not moving within Europe, we're talking about 47.3 million in, in 2010. The estimated number from 2003 on is between 1.5 and 2 million per year. Now, I have a question for you. 
What do these pictures have in common? What's a common denominator in relation to these pictures? This isn't a rhetorical question. I'm looking for answers. What do you think they share? Yes? Multiple colors, maybe? Multiple colors. That's good. That's good. Something more. Look at each picture. Um, this is not going to work at all. All right. Um, you have the face of a, of a, of a very well-known social theorist, political social theorist. You have a picture that looks at economics, money. You have a picture that's cross-generational. You have a picture that's uh, interracial. You have a picture of physical uh, disability. You have a picture that relates to religion. You have a picture that relates to migration. And you have a picture with many, uh, with a flag with many culture, many colors. Any ideas? Diversity. Diversity. It's diversity. Real simple. Diversity. Where you've got gender, you've got inclusion, ethnicity, <coughs> heritage, you have socioeconomic, you have family, you have people. You've got lots and lots of different things in, that relate to what we talk about in terms of diversity. What is diversity? Diversity is about people. It's about the environment we work in and all, and all of us reaching our uh, panacea of accomplishments. I would say our, the pinnacle of our accomplishments, because that's a typo. It's about how we value and appreciate those that are unlike ourselves. Diversity is not about good or bad, positive or negative. It's about being different. There isn't a negative associated with being different. The stereotype is if they're not like us, then they're not as good as us. They have less than us. They don't provide as much as us. Okay, in terms of diversity, what is it we want? Assimilation or integration? Assimilation is making everybody who comes in just like us. That's assuming that the us remains constant. No society is constant. Every society is constantly changing. And rather than look at the idea of bringing people in to be just like us, why not look at people coming into our societies and adding to what we have? So, you know, if, if, we're, if the goal is, if what happens is assimilation, then uh, they're outsiders and not members of the dominant group. And that means, in many, many cases, giving up their values and adopting the values of others as a means of survival. And in, through history, we see this happening. People coming in and adopting the ways of the majority group, presuming that this, and, and presuming that this is going to enable them to become part of the culture. But down the road, what history has also shown us is if it doesn't happen in the first generation, by the second generation, there's a need to identify with historical roots. All right? This assimilation process is very uncomfortable, but in many cases it becomes a matter of survival. Our goal here is to identify ways to allow people to become integrated versus being assimilated. How do we achieve what we're talking about in terms of, of integration. Well, what we know is we can learn to understand and appreciate values, expectations, and com communication styles of other traditions. And we can adjust appropriately. You can learn these things. These are not ingrained. They're not genetic. These are learned behaviors. And they can be modified. They can be um, embellished. They can be changed. Achieving integration versus assimilation calls for what I term 
multicultural communicative competence. You begin by understanding that behavior that makes no sense to you might make perfect sense to others, and vice versa. And you're not so quick to judge anymore. You begin to tolerate opinions and actions that you have dismissed before this. What does it mean to communicate? Any ideas? I mean, I, okay, I've got it here. Communicate comes from the word, Latin word to share, uh, to exchange information, uh, to convey, to understand one another, to exchange information and exchange uh, information between individuals by means of speaking, writing, or using a common system of signs or behaviors. Fact. All behaviors are learned. You're not born with any behaviors. You learn them vis-a-vis -vis socialization, vis-a-vis -vis the family, vis-a-vis -vis experiences. And you learn them as displayed in a particular cultural context. Culturally effective communication can be learned because you can learn what's appropriate in different and in uh, different cultural contexts. Okay, what do you all think this represents? Again, not a rhetorical question. <laughs> Any ideas? It shows a direction. It shows a direction. Anyone else? Yes. A gun. A gun. gun. What? It's trying to count something. It's trying to count something. To point out. Actually, it's Chinese for the number seven. No. All right? Nice. But you're not wrong. <laughs> okay, counting by hand in Chinese. I've got the Chinese symbols, uh, icons for counting numbers. One is a closed fist with the hand, with the finger up. Two, three, four, five. Okay, I'm gonna get this right. Six, seven, Eight, nine, and in this particular instance, because it, it changes from dialect to dialect. Mandarin Chinese has dif different symbols. It is, okay, put this down. Uh, let me see if I can do this. This is ten. Is it the same in Korean? Any ideas? Okay, no, no, it's not. It's not. For example... Um, this is one, and uh, let me see if I'm going to get, I'm going to get this wrong now, I'm sure I am. Uh, I can tell you this is one, two, three, four, five, the thumb in. What I'm trying to point out here is that these are symbols that are part of communication that can result in miscommunication if we're assuming everyone is just like us. Nonverbal communication, here we have the classic symbol. Commonly, everyone say, assumes that this means okay. okay. In France, it means you're worthless. In Japan, it means money. It represents money. Uh, in Germany, it's a rude gesture, as in Malta, Greece, Brazil. Uh, it, it's a rude gesture. In Malta, Greece, and Brazil, it's an obscene gesture. Thumbs up, commonly okay. Australia and Iran, it means a rude, something that's rude. Uh, in Nigeria, very offensive, you can imagine. Uh, in Japan, it represents the number five. Remember I said Korea, it's the thumb down. Japan, it's the thumb up. In Turkey, it's the political rightist party. I found that very interesting. Uh, the, okay, forgive me, my great friends, forgive me. This, uh, commonly in Western Europe, uh, tends to mean stop, right? Stop. Um, in Turkey, you get nothing from me. In other words, if, you, if, if, if someone Turkish gives you this uh, 
presents you with presents you with this gesture, it means you're not going to get anything from him. Um, in West Africa, you have five fathers, <laughs> and in Greece, it's real, especially if there's a movement with it. <laughs> forgive me. Uh, it, it represents something uh, quite rude. Um, the the last one is okay. If I'm going to be okay, like this, the thumb with the finger over it. Uh, Turkey, Greece, Tunisia, Holland, an obscene gesture. Russia, you get nothing from me. What's, this, what's the gesture in Turkey for you get nothing from me? As you all do things like that to me. Right. Uh, in Yugoslavia, you can't have it. Yugoslavia meaning the former, the, the current countries of the former uh, state of Yugoslavia. Um, See if I can remember them all. Serbia, Slovenia, uh, Firon, former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. We're in Greece. That's how we say it. Um, uh, Bosnia Herzegovina, Croatia, um, Belarus, and I'm forgetting another country. But in Brazil, the former ones are all very negative, aren't they? In Brazil, it's good luck. Okay, what is culture? So far we've talked about diversity, we've talked a little bit about communication and nonverbal communication, what links them, what links them is culture. Culture is the distinctive life way of a people, united by a common language and governed by rules and models for their beliefs and behaviors. In layman's term, culture is what we live every day and what we bring with us uh, to all our encounters. Um, culture is the root of that tree, the stem and the branch, while civilization is the branch, the leaf, and the blossoms. Now, this is a favorite cartoon of mine. It's a fish in a fishbowl. And you have four separate scenes. And it ends by yelling out, totally surprised, I'm living in water. Culture is what water is to the fish. It takes it for granted until it's outside that environment. You don't really think about your own culture until you're outside your own culture. And one of the reasons you don't think about your own culture is because you have an effective filter that literally closes you in a way to keep you safe. What we're talking about here about diversity and communication and culture is helping you open up the, that filter, that mesh, so that the holes of that mesh or that net are not that small but are larger because you're training yourself to understand that difference isn't bad. <coughs> okay, our own culture provides the lens through which we view the world, the logic. But which, by which we order it, the grammar by which we make sense. Okay, this is a favorite of mine as well. Look at it carefully. It's an elephant, correct? And you've got a bunch of people standing around who are blindfolded, and they're defining what they think it is. Now, so you've got one person who touches the tusk and says it's a spear. The other one has his hand on the trunk. It's a snake. The third grasps the very large leg of the elephant and says it's a tree. Another one moving his hands around the side of the elephant, huge surface, says it's a wall. The last, another one in the back pulling on the tail or grasping the tail says it's a rope. And the one on top who feels the ear, the movement of the air of the elephant, says it's a fan. What does this cartoon symbolize for us? What's it trying to, what's it trying to explain? Different points of view. Something else? Yes. Part of the whole will not be described whole. Part of the whole doesn't describe the whole. Very good. Someone else? Yes. Uh, but when I write a note from everything else, we have the wrong idea about the 
when our art, when our eyes are closed, we don't see things that are the other things around us. Could it also be someone else? Not open-minded. Imagination. Different perceptions lead to different points of view. Different experiences lead, lead to different points of view. These individuals are defining it based on their experiences. They can't see it, so they're touching it and going, okay, this in my experience is a tusk, is, is a spear. This in my experience <laughs> would be a rope. This in my experience would be a tree. So experience plays a very, very... Uh, important role. The cultural context that you're coming from. I'm getting better at this. Not hitting it. All right. I think you've probably all heard of or seen the cultural iceberg, uh, where appearances can be deceptive. More, much more is hidden below than is revealed. Um, the things we see are behaviors, traditions, customs, things we taste, taste touch, smell, or, or, or we hear, but more than, in some cases, more than 90% are things we don't see that are based on life experiences. Okay, given that learning is influenced by individual experiences, individual talents, prior learning, language, culture, family, community values, because all of these come into play, in how we interpret and understand situations around us and our students. Multicultural competence and communication come into play. The framework for this is awareness, comprehension, and competent skills. Knowledge, skills, and motivation. Thus, to help diverse groups avoid the game of assimilation, but rather embrace integration, we need to understand the role of cult that culture plays directly and indirectly in our dealings with others, and to develop our own cultural communicative competence so that we can be more effective in providing services. Now, having said all of that, there's a couple of points I'd like to make. Um, we tend to, along with the stereotypes we carry about people, we carry stereotypes about what communication is and what, how we use this communication. Um, there are some classic stereotypes. When individuals of one culture, one language, find themselves surrounded or in, in, uh, in close proximity with others from different cultures, and different languages, what do you think either you've done or others do? They want to talk to this other person. They don't speak the language. They're not very familiar with the culture. What do they do? I'm standing in front of a group of people. I'm talking, I, I, I'm, I'm speaking Greek. The people across from me don't speak Greek. What behavior are they going to exhibit? Any ideas? Body language. Body language, body language is one factor. Very definitely. What kind of body language? Gentle things. Kind. Gentle things. Kind. Gestures. Gestures. Classic stereotype. They begin to either speak louder or slower and louder. Slower. Slower. And sometimes louder. They are aware of the fact that the other person isn't understanding. And the assumption is they're speaking too quickly or it isn't loud enough. They'll sometimes combine gestures with words. Um, but in, in this particular instance, there's another factor that comes into play that I haven't mentioned over here, uh, and that has to do with 
uh, factors that influence communication. <coughs> um, and we're talking about kinesics, we're talking about proxemics, we're talking about distances between people. I mean, if you take a, an American, and you take a Greek, okay, I'm going to play myself and myself. Um, I'm the Greek at this moment, and this is the American. And I'm, no, actually, this is the Greek, and I'm the American. And the Greek is speaking and coming closer to me, and as American, I'm pulling back because I have a, I have a spatial dimension that is inculcated, it's ingrained in me. I'm socialized to keep a particular distance. Certain cultures have much smaller distances. So when we're talking about communication, louder, slower, and if the person begins to come closer to me, I begin to pull back to the point where if they get too close, if they enter into my personal space, I will break the, 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 the conversation completely, the communication act. These are all factors. Haptics has to do with the touching. Kinesics has to, has to do with the movement. Gestures, eye contact. Do I look you in the eye or do I not look you in the eye? Does that, what does that mean in my culture versus another culture? As teachers, if you have students that are from um, many Asian countries, looking at the teacher, looking into the eyes of the teacher is considered um, as an insult. It's disrespectful. In Greek culture, if the child doesn't look at the teacher in the eye, he's hiding something. He's, you know, he's, and not only. Um, in certain Asian cultures, uh, exhibiting, visually, exhibiting um, remorse or sadness is, not, is disrespectful. So in contrast, what they'll do is you're chastising them. You're saying you haven't done your homework and you haven't done the assignment the way, and the child is smiling at you. <laughs> Again, a potential uh, situation of miscommunication because you're expecting this child to, uh, in essence, be remorseful. But in his or her culture, that's not acceptable. Myths related to multi multicultural competence and intercultural communication. Basically, deep down, we are all the same. No, we're not. Uh, it all comes down to personality. No, it doesn't. Um, if I myself don't put on airs, it'll be all okay. No, not right. Communication only takes place when we choose to send information. By choosing not to send information, you're sending information. The message you send, either verbal or nonverbal, is coded, and the recipient must decode it, pass it through this filter, move it along, encode their own message, and send it back. Choosing not to discuss certain topics uh, or certain issues can minimize problems and discomfort. You know, the, an old adage is, oh, we don't talk about politics, religion, etc. Well, choosing not to discuss them doesn't mean that that's going to lead to positive and effective communication. All right, six fundamental patterns of cultural differences. What do we mean by these? There are different communication styles, attitudes towards conflict, approaches to completing tasks, decision-making styles, attitudes towards disclosure, and approaches to knowing. One of a, a, an example um, of this is who, what role does gender play? Um, do you talk with the mother or do you talk with the father? In certain cultures, the mother doesn't have a primary role. In other cultures, fathers don't have the primary role. Um, we, we have cultures that are um, that are uh, have high context orientations we have cultures that have low context orientations we have children and we have individuals who are field dependent and field independent in their in the way they perceive things field independence and field dependence has to do is with how they they see things you've heard of the old saying um, 
you you you're not you you're looking at the trees and not seeing the forest, or you're seeing the forest and not the trees. Feel dependence, feel independence, and the way you teach can be interpreted or misinterpreted by the child who is either feel dependent or field independent, and to a large degree, and I please, and please here I'd like to make a point that I'm giving you generalizations and not stereotypes, but these are factors that do come into play. Um, we, we, I'm not talking about, it, I'm not, I don't have a slide here on it, but multiple intelligences, learning styles, can and in many cases are learned culturally, because they're socialized into these things by the family. Now, I'm going to skip guidelines for communicative competence because essentially it's saying don't prejudge. Don't assume similarity unless you see similarity. Assume that they're going to be different from you. Now, multicultural premise is that we're all cultural beings. We all carry our own culture. We, we carry our individual culture. We carry our group culture. We carry our professional culture. We, ca we carry elements of our national culture. All of these make us individuals. We all carry multiple identities. In given circumstances, we, have, we express our identities differently. Children that come into your classrooms may not have multiple scads of them, but they do have different orientations, which in many, many instances are culturally learned and culturally determined. Now, cultural awareness into cultural sensitivity. Factors that play in our prejudice, ethnocentrism, stereotypes, this long list along the side here. And essentially what we're saying is the ability to be open and to learning about and accepting a different cultural groups is what we talk about when we talk about cultural awareness. And it is a cornerstone of effective diversity. Uh, this bottom uh, cartoon has an Islamic woman and a non-Islamic young man. Look at the posture of both. They need to work in a similar environment. They need to be working together. The messages are not being heard from either one side or the other. Now, what and how can we become better culturally attuned communicators today? This is a classic, this is a classic learning pyramid. Um, Y'all have heard of the learning pyramid? How you spend your time translates into how much you gain back. If you read, you're going to remember only 10% of what you've read, long term. 20% uh, of what you hear, 30% of what you see, 50% of what you hear and see, 70 of what we say, and 90, 90% of what we both do and say in terms of participating. Doing a dramatic presentation, simulating the, re simulating the real experience, doing the real thing. As participants in this seminar, in this program, you're asked not to give your time to the top two-thirds. You're asked to invest in the last 10%, because that's what's going to stay with you. Listening to me speak is not going to be the same unless you literally put yourselves between in dyads and triads and talk about gestures and meanings and how this can translate into schooling and, and what what and how and what and how you prepare your lessons. Now, positively linking diversity no, that went too fast. Positively linking diversity in communication. Very simply, diversity is an added value. A classroom that is diverse is by definition richer. It is by definition something that you, you won't forget, nor will the children in that class, if you maximize what they're bringing into the classroom. And in ending, um, I'd like simply to quote 
Dante, who oh, and I won't even attempt the Italian, uh, says diverse voices make sweet music as diverse conditions in our lives renders sweet harmony. Think about it. And in closing, I'd like to thank you, and I don't know if I've caught all the languages, but congratulations, you're all entering into an area that is dynamic, is possibly the most fulfilling you'll be. Teaching per se is like that, but when you add that wonderful element of diversity and difference, you just become that much richer. Thank you very much.